Welcome. We seem to have passed the uh, bottom of the hour, so I guess we should start. So welcome to this session on, what is the exact title? It's on in, uh, in, <laughs> internet, internet fragmentation, perspectives and collaboration. So that's a good clue as to where we're heading. Um, it's been an interesting topic to watch being talked about this week. Lots of opinions, lots of definitions, the beginnings of a new framework for how to understand it and discuss it, which is still growing and still being thought of. So there's really a lot of really interesting uh, people, knowledgeable people on this round table, and we really wanna get a discussion going of all the people around the table. And also, as we move on, all of you that are sitting back here. So anybody that's gonna wanna talk is gonna have to come. There are only a few microphones, so you will have to come up and get a microphone when you wanna talk. But anyhow, so I want to welcome you all, and I really wanna get started. And as opposed to me saying a lot more, because you all have a lot more to say. So, Elena Plexiga from ICANN, would you like to start us off with a view? I'm on. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Avi. Yes, I can kick off with some more opinions and some more definitions, which I'm sure that you'll be very happy to, to hear. Um, so, as you know, I work for ICANN, representing a technical organization. And therefore, if you will, what I will come uh, here with does come from the technical world. I think that to talk about uh, internet fragmentation, one should start by defining, by singling out what it is that makes the internet single, what it is that makes it one. Because as we all know, and I was having this discussion with Avery at breakfast, the internet anyway is not one. It's myriads of different networks. It runs through all kinds of communication infrastructure. What is it that binds it together to what we call today global internet? And this is none other than the unique identifiers, the domain names, the namespace, the IP addresses, and the internet protocols alongside. Okay, I am not a technical person, so I think of it some, uh, as some sort of common technical languages that all devices speak, and they can find each other on the network. And the emphasis being on the word unique. Uh, and it's this uniqueness that gives us the global internet. As long as different networks and devices connected on them use the same unique set of identifiers, we have one internet. And that's, of course, ICANN's mission, uh, one internet, to ensure a stable and secure operation of the internet's unique identifiers. We we'll do that together with our sibling organizations, the RIRs, the, the ITF, etc. That said, a fragmented internet would go against everything ICANN stands for, everything ICANN was created to do. But what is, what would be internet fragmentation? At the content level, there are already limitations. Uh, content is not available to everyone, everywhere. That's been happening for years, and it's even desirable in some cases. Think of parental controls. Of course, it's not desirable in other cases. But that's not internet fragmentation. It's limitations as to the content a user can access, um, user experience uh, fragmentation, if you will. It, but it's not internet fragmentation, and it's actually confusing, and because I was told to be a little bit inflammatory, it's actually, to my mind, dangerous <laughs> to keep referring to content level limitations as internet fragmentation. Because people um, leave a discussion with the impression that the internet is already fragmented. And that can become, if you will, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm talking of um, uh, own experience. Um, I've been discussing with parliamentarians about legislation that would create this or that. And when we got to that point, they were saying to me, but it is already fragmented, so why would we, what, would, why, what is there? That's why I'm saying it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, the internet is still there, it's not broken. Uh, fragmentation would be, if we take the, an example of the, the postal service, would be if the postal service stops being there. If I tell my postman that I don't want to receive letters from Avery, 
that's not in their fragmentation. It's just that I don't want a specific part of the content. Uh, fragmentation is when the internet breaks at technical level, when you don't have interoperability. So, is the internet fragmented today? No. At technical layer, absolutely not. Can it be fragmented? Yes, <laughs> I think it might. It might. Um, alternative namespaces. If we have that, the uniqueness is gone. Uh, a second root of the internet. The uniqueness is gone. Um, and I can. I will not go into the technical side of it because, first of all, I'm not technical. And second, and most importantly, because I think that although fragmentation, fragmenting the internet is a technical issue, it will not come if it comes from the technical world. It will come from the political world. Um, deliberately or by accident, uh, with the latter, the accident being what concerns me the most. Um, the million dollar question, if you will, uh, is will the global internet survive a fragmented world? So, you know, we live in a world that is not the same as it, as it used to be before. There's a lot of politicization around a number of issues. And we start to see this politicization over the unique identifiers as well. Them getting drawn into the geopolitical agenda. And that can be dangerous for the very global nature of the internet. I'll stop here. I hope that was good. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. <clears throat> the next person I have is Jennifer Chung from Dot Asia to basically give her impressions, definitions, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Avri. Uh, my name is Jennifer Chung. I work for Dot Asia organization, um, which is obviously Dot Asia is a registry operator of the Dot Asia top level um, domain. I guess from my point of view, whether or not I can add to the definition or add to the controversy of this discussion that hopefully we'll have here is um, Dot Asia is a registry. We of course sit on the application layer of the technical part of the internet. And I think perhaps we are quite clear on the fact that, you know, what technical fragmentation might be, you know, if we start with the baseline, you know, when we're looking at where are we starting this assessment from? If the assumption that the primary benefits of the core features is to be able to have universal connectivity and to have the interoperability, I'm really bad with this word, between these consenting devices, then I think there's that very baseline that we can agree upon. I don't think a lot of people are, are, are really confused about it or, or would argue against this part. I think where we're coming from now is, I think many different definitions try to bucket fragmentation into different categories. I see a lot of um, papers and, and research and also opinions saying that first there's a fragmentation of the technical layer which hopefully is not controversial. Secondly, there's a fragmentation of the user experience or, or more of on the uh, the end user or how we experience uh, how we navigate and thirdly is a fragmentation mainly on the policy level which is more governed by you know places in where decision making is is made there or in governments where there's decision making uh, on policy regulations legislations that could aim to destabilize or could fragment the internet as we see it I think what is really important that we should also remember is what isn't fragmentation. I think the word fragmentation is now used, um, it is very important to, to use this word, but if we use this word to describe every single thing that is different, uh, I think we are, it behooves us to actually pull back and realize, no, this is actually something that is good for the development of the internet. One example I'd like to bring out from the .asia point of view is a lot of people see internationalized domain names as hey this is you know what's what's going on here could there be a threat of fragmentation is this actually already a fragmentation and i i would like to pause it to say actually international internationalized domain names which means domain names that can be uh, seen in scripts such as um, Urdu or the Han script, which is Chinese, uh, Korean, and Japanese, also use the Han script. These scripts 
allow you to see the domain name in the native script. And um, the threat here really is, if this is not implemented well, then we have the, the possibility or the, the danger of having a fragmented internet, not the fact that we are implementing this becomes a fragmentation of the internet. So that's uh, one thing I'd like to really bring up first. And, um, and the second thing is when we're looking at a different part of fragmentation, when we're looking at, uh, and now I'm talking more about the policy level, when we're looking at where we're sitting right now at the Internet Governance Forum, we're talking about these things. But when we're looking at bodies that decide regulations, upcoming legislations, what we really have to remember is that when these actions and legislations aim at this content and user layer, and this causes internet fragmentation, that it also threatens the technical layer because then the implementation then comes down that effect, there's a knock-on effect where things like internet shutdowns come down from any kind of policy level, or uh, things like um, you know when people ask, certain bodies to shut down portions of the internet. So th those are the geopolitical concerns and pressures that we have to resist when we talk about fragmentation as well. And I think I want to end a little bit more with like, you know, at least for my first intervention, to mitigate these risks really requires a lot of, first of all, conversation and, and coordination, but also not duplicating all this conversation into different silos where nobody's talking to each other and not quite getting the part where we need to coordinate well. So I'll stop right here. Okay, thank you. It was interesting to me to hear IDN included in the list of possible fragmentation. So thank you for bringing that up and I'll be interested to hear more about the whole notion of implementation being something that could cause that. Uh, the next person on the list is uh, Timie Suto, uh, ICC bassist. Thank you, Avery. Thanks, everyone. Yes, um, Tim Ashuta, Global Digital Policy Lead at the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're um, representatives of, of global industry. We have around 45 million members in over 170 countries across all different sizes and, and, and industries. Um, what does fragmentation mean to me from this perspective and to us? Um, and I have to react to what the, the others have, have said before because I think that's the whole point of this conversation. Um, on that baseline layer that Elena you were talking about, is the internet fragmented? No, no, it's not. It's it's working, um, but attempts have been made, and were sort of successful to disconnect and prove that it can, it really can. Um, and I think I need to agree with Jennifer. Uh, your last point there, that certain pressures that come, not at the technical layer, but at the top of all of that, at the content layer, at the data layer, at the policy layer, governance layer, have very real impacts on that technical layer and the internet way, uh, this network of networks. Um, and I think disregarding that and saying uh, the internet works, it's not fragmented, is putting our heads in the sand because there's real dangers of the internet fragmenting if we buy into the fact that we can fragment the top of it because it's really easy for that to then go down. That is my maybe a bit controversial view, but I think we cannot disregard this, um, especially when we are at forums of this and others that don't have the technical expertise uh, maybe this forum has because it's multi-stakeholder, but other forums that make decisions at the political layers, at the um, content layers, at the policy governance layers, might not have all that really technical background. So it's easy, first of all, for them to confuse things. Uh, and secondly, thinking that if it can be done at the top, uh, why not do it elsewhere? What is there to lose? And I think those are very dangerous questions to ask. Um, so for us on the business side, to, to bring it back um, to my official talking points, <laughs> um, for us what, what matters here is the digital economy that was built on top uh, of the internet and digital technologies and everything that the internet enables. Um, and when I talk about the digital economy, it's not just about um, GDP, 
um, or, or the bottom lines of, of business. Um, but the society, the development goals, um, the growth, uh, both personally, uh, both for communities and for economies, um, that was fueled by the internet. Um, and that really depends for us on the ability to move data across borders, to make sure that data supports global trade, information exchange, commerce, um, healthcare, medicine, research, everything that is built on the top um, of data uh, being able to flow across borders. And their barriers to that, those data flows for me are real examples of internet fragmentation. Maybe I don't have a better word to call it, so <laughs> we, can, we can put that challenge to the audience here if you have better ways to call it. But if barriers to data flows coming from various concerns, um, concerns mostly about trust on the internet, whether it is I don't trust my data to go outside my region because the privacy protections are not the same or um, the IP protections are not the same or the consumer protections are not the same or just because I think I can create more value by keeping it here and not letting others um, share it, uh, access it, uh, process it. Um, I think those are very dangerous thoughts and, and thoughts to, to data localization and, and fragmentation in this layer, um, I think, first of all, hamper a lot of the benefits of the internet, even if it works technically, the benefits don't come. Um, and it's not a user choice, right? It's not Avri saying, I don't want to receive uh, letters from you. I cannot receive letters from you because others have made that choice for me. And that's also another question that we might want to um, delve into later. So I'll leave it at that, and I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, you're all starting to answer the question, and we're also all starting to have a little bit of the discussion. Though all these people talking about not sending me letters is going to get sad. Um, but anyhow, next I'd like to go to Javier Parlero, who's a consultant, digital rights, tech, and culture. So Javier, is a remote? Is, yeah. So yes, is he available he to talk? Yes, please, go. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for, for being there. I am connected from Argentina, so hi to everyone there. Uh, so let me go with the, uh, my attempt at responding at this very difficult and uh, specific question. What I would say is that um, I have to agree with all of that was said before. I think this is a very complex issue that starts with a very specific definition uh, that is technical, right? And listening to Jen, I have to agree right, about uh, thinking about the, what makes the internet one, right, which is these unique identifiers, protocols, and the common language that is spoken. But one of the aspects that I would like to bring up uh, from a civil society perspective is not only uh, what makes the internet unique or one, but also why that happens. What is the reason to be that the internet has, at least for most of us as uh, users. And that's actually the ability for us to be able to communicate and to connect with everyone, right? So that's, I think, what is at the core of this confusion uh, or this idea, right? That, for example, politicians would say, oh, the internet is already fragmented, right? Because there is this perception that the reason that the internet has to be has been changing fast. It has become more closed, more seemingly or perceive, you know, in, in perception, it has become more disconnected, more uh, unable to provide that, sen that, that sensation of connection and, um, and you know, the ability to, to express yourself without borders and to access information and so on. So I would, I, I would dare to go a bit further uh, and say that it's actually not a confusion, this idea that, you know, that, that, that intertwines the political application uh, technical and protocol uh, levels of the discussion. It's not a confusion. It's something that happens because the, the thing that goes across all of these dimensions is the reason of the internet to be, right? And it, the reason to be of the internet is for connection and for, um, you know, it's technology that enables the enjoyment of rights and so on. So that, that, that apparent confusion is actually a part of the problem. And also as, as, also as 
um, the last speaker before me, Taimiya, said, many of these uh, situations, these decisions uh, in the policy level or the application level as well, when a private company becomes a dominant actor in one area of, uh, uh, of uh, internet services, for example, all of that ends up affecting somehow technical uh, decisions, right? So for example, politics can mandate shutdowns or data retention or national gateways, right? But also certain companies, for example, can uh, exert more and more influence into certain protocols, for example. A, a, a key example that comes to mind is the DRM protocols that have been added to uh, the W3C discussions about uh, web protocols, for example, right? And many of that comes from private parties, not necessarily governments, right? Um, also, another example when it comes to government that goes beyond the extreme example of shutdowns could be the censorship attempts that are done through, you know, mandating changes to the DNS uh, resolvers, right? Or putting pressure into DNS servers, right? So all of that uh, is just a way of saying that this dimension, even if it is not part of the technical specific concrete definition of fragmentation, which I share is more of a technical specific discussion that maybe can be benefited you know, by, by being correctly framed and limited. But all of these aspects that I've just been mentioning are also important. They may not be part of the definition, but they are part of the problem and then a part of the perception that has to do with the idea that we have about the internet and how we think that we want to use it. I think that uh, when it comes to working on this, we will have to make a big effort to dis make a distinction about these different dimensions, maybe focus on some of them, like the, the protocols one, but the, you know, because the other ones tend to have their own areas of discussion, right? The ones about censorship of applications or the ones about bad policies, right? All of those are properly covered, let's say, by some other actors, or some other activity, discussion, regulation, civil society actors that are actually very active on that, but on these other areas, uh, there's not that much engagement. And maybe that's where uh, a, a more uh, narrow definition of the issue can be of service, right? Just to inspire more attention to the under underrepresented dimension, if you may. But the fact is that everything uh, is important and, and, and should be considered. So I would stop there for the initial um, intervention. And um, thank you again for, for the invitation and for the opportunity to be there virtually. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. And, and thank you for saying it was virtual when I said remote. That was an old fashioned word that we're not really supposed to use anymore. So the virtually or the online. <laughs> so I really appreciate the correction. Uh, the next person I'd like to go to in this initial set of discussions is Nishigata-san, a Japanese uh, government, to give us a, um, where's the microphone to go? Okay, it was gonna go there. So please, thank you now that you have a, a microphone, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is, thank you for the kind introduction. My name is Nobu Nishigata from the Japanese government. I'm working at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, who hosts this IGF event. So thank you for coming. And uh, we do appreciate everybody's the participation and the contribution, which made this event good, really good. Thank you very much again. So the, getting back to the, the point of the internet of fragmentation, since I'm the government of Shell, then I'm not a tech person either. I can write the registration though, I'm not the code. So, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, the, it's confusing matter to me, right? So just some people already mentioned, it's many, many different uh, definition. And then there's a nature of the government person. We need a definition before starting talk, right? <laughs> but I tried my best today. And then maybe, you know, the, this is a part of my job to just the following the, what, what is happening in the internet every day. Then, then I do recognize some, or maybe most, of the recent issues. It just, you know, following up on the category of the internet fragmentation. Then, then you know, I refrain to speak the particular names of countries, but I do recognize that there is some frustration in the tech community particularly. Uh, you know, and I'm on several kinds of the fragmentation. And uh, from the government perspective, then uh, I would understand the frustration against, the, particularly against the government intervention and its forceful type of fragmentation, uh, for example, like an internet shutdown during the election period, that, that kind of things. And then, 
However, though, like, uh, you know, from the government perspective, it, this is not a job of our ministry, but uh, some other part of the government. We have to do some jobs, particularly for our public safety perspective, uh, particularly within the border, you know, that the government has to serve. In the, the, you know, internet is global, this is great, but on the other hand, the, the border matters to the government, you know. So then, well, not only for the public safety, but the government may make some actions that frustrate you guys in the tech community, and for the sake of the other high-level policy agenda for like economic development or national safety, et cetera, et cetera. So this could be a, maybe today's one of the discussion point, how far the government can do or allow to do these jobs. And I understand that some communities hate the, even the single government intervention to the internet, however, but we do understand though, well, we have to be accountable for these actions. And in Japan's case, fortunately, you know, we, we don't see these case, the severe cases yet. And of course, the, the government of Japan respects the open and free internet. I mean, you can see many evidence that like we support the declaration of the future internet uh, published by the US government. Or like a Japan chairs of this G7 meetings this year. And the G7 agreed the support to DFI, and it's, uh, it's our chair's leadership. And Japan and the US both government get together, then they just finished our day zero session on the declaration of the future internet to evangelize people in the IGF venue here. So, you know, it's go. I understand that some of the government action in general may frustrate the internet people, but on the other hand, you know, it is not only the internet people that uh, get frustrated, you know, the, the government is also sometimes get frustrated or not, uh, I would say at least not satisfied with the current internet. And there are some issues that to be solved. Uh, for example, though, like uh, there are issues, I would say like uh, regarding the, the fragmentation, maybe that, that goes upon uh, like a user interface type of fragmentation, like, uh, you know, the filter bubble or echo chamber or these kind of things. And this is not only the, the, the phenomena, but the, the, these things bring more some bad side effects brought by these internet services, right? So this is the issue that we are not satisfied and we have to tackle. But on the other hand, the government is not, cannot solve these things by ourselves. We need particularly the technicians and technical people or maybe other part of the society, but we need some other's help to, to tackle and solve these problems. So, and uh, in the end of my intervention, maybe let me say that, uh, you know, like we had uh, our Prime Minister Kishida came into the IGF meeting, if you are aware of, and uh, he just committed that, uh, you know, to the, our effort to, to maintain open, free internet. And particularly the reason is that, that, that we shouldn't leave no, anyone behind uh, from the benefit of the internet that brought for the, like 30, 40 years. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an interesting first set of comments in that it started very low with a very precise, we've added nuances as we've sort of moved up the scale and then it's almost flowered to the point of anything that interferes with an open and free internet can perhaps be seen as, as a fragmentation. And, and, and so that is a very good representation of sort of the blossoming of this conversation, the blossoming of the differences that many of us have. I'd like to now go and call on some other folks. We've got really an amazing number of folks around this table that, that have probably good things to say. And dig a little deeper. Perhaps there'll be other nuances and other extensions that'll get added, but also to dig a little deeper into some of what's been said. And next, I'd like to go to Alhaji Embo, who's a member of parliament of the Gambia. So you, oh. Um, thank you very much um, for the introduction. I'm Honorable Allah Jimbo from the Gambia, Member of Parliament, and also the Vice Chair of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Um, I think we are discussing a very important topic, um, a topic that is actually um, confusing some people um, because of definition. Uh, but I quite agree um, that anything that can actually interferes with the free flow of the internet, actually you can actually call it um, internet fragmentation. Um, uh, I'm a lawmaker, but I came from the tech community, so, um, uh, so we, we, we will be okay with that. Now, um, as we try to have a 
stable and integrated internet. This fragmentation, whether it's at the technical level or whether it's at the government level or whether it's at the business level, because these are the three areas that you can actually see the fragmentation um, may happen. So we may, we may have an issue at the level of legislation because legislators don't want to legislate anything that's ambiguous. We want to be very clear on what we are trying to legislate. And uh, again, the internet is such a way that um, you don't want to put in any kind of legislation that would actually hamper or stifle innovation. And again, when you have these um, uh, fragments of the internet, like these uh, little islands um, uh, that actually are not talking to each other, um, you know, regularly or um, you know optimally, then we may have an issue. Um, the causes, you know, it could be political by our own governments, um, but at the side of legislation, I think there could be an issue here, because we are trying to have a free flow, and we are also trying to. Um, I try to streamline our legislations across, across the world. Um, that's the reason why here you see that we have African parliamentarians, we have some from um, the European Parliament, and uh, we've been talking what can we do together to ensure that we have a safe, secure, um, and integrated internet. So uh, bringing these sp splinter groups um, would cause us actually more problems. Because we already have issues in terms of legislation, now, bringing actually more divisions on this um, area is actually going to cause us more problems. So I think uh, this is something we really need to discuss to see what we can do together to ensure that we leave it the way it is and then to ensure that we promote um, a secure and integrated um, connectivity. In that case, we can work together as legislators or as policymakers to ensure that um, um, uh, we can streamline um, you know, what we do. Now, um, you, know, you just mentioned about um, you know, sometimes about the internet shutdown. But personally, I would actually call it um, um, internet disruption. Uh, because what is happening right now is um, they're trying to um, you know, stop particular applications from running, not the entire internet. So that is actually disruption. So you're not really shutting down the internet completely, but you are just actually stopping particular applications from actually running. And I think all those things actually is something that we really need to look at to see that um, this disruption of the internet actually stopped because, and this fragmentation actually would actually propel that more than actually just. So, at uh, the side of legislation, I think it's better we leave it the way it is and support, um, um, support it more to ensure that we have free flow and we also have um, um, integrated and we also have it more secure for everybody to live. Thank you. Thank you for basically taking it a little further into differentiating sort of the different behaviors and the different problems, and that, and that perhaps is helpful. Next, I'd like to go to Tomoaki Watanabe, who's from the Center for Global Communications in Tokyo. And by the way, thank you, everybody, for helping play the game with Pass the Microphone, so please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tomoaki Watanabe. I'm an academic uh, based in Tokyo. Um, so um, the way I thought about this uh, issue is when is Splinternet bad or bad enough? And um, I kind of agree or I, I kind of resonate with the idea that um, the, the democratic or po politically motivated splinternet is the one uh, we should get most concerned about. Uh, but then um, maybe um, we should be aware of the fact that um, democracy, even in some of the most democratic countries, is uh, these days uh, challenged to an extent uh, or another. Um, I think uh, things like war against terrorism or uh, measures against rioting or civil unrest, um, it, those things are not that foreign to some of the most uh, democratic countries. Um, and. I'm sure that some level of internet regulation uh, is desired by governments uh, of those countries. Uh, so um, I, I don't, and, and also let me add uh, one more thing, that having a free and open internet, uh, I, 
in, in principle, I'm, I tend to think that's a good thing, uh, that's a condition for a better society. But also, I think these days, a lot of questions are asked, how good it is, or is this, is this enough to, to bring about good changes? Or sometimes, as many people have already mentioned, uh, it causes really uh, serious adverse effects. Uh, and in light of those things, I think uh, we really have to think carefully uh, how to proceed in a way. Um, in, because I, I think it's not really uh, so simple as to say, oh, only certain countries are uh, problematic and these countries are more like um, uh, pro-freedom, pro-unified uh, uni internet. Uh, because I think upon closer inspection, uh, even in those countries which are pro-democracy, pro-unified internet, uh, there are serious problems and concerns, and maybe studying those things more closely, discussing about those things closely, uh, might give us a better way to think about um, maybe a more comprehensive package. Uh, maybe the, the unified internet is just one of, or part of the package that would bring about a good social changes. Maybe um, I spoke long enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so it, it actually starts to get even more a little confusing in terms of free and open is not always free and open and certainly not always good. And we've certainly heard that before. Um, and, and, and I'm sort of starting to, to feel that, that it's starting to cover a lot and not cover much at the same time. So it's becoming actually a more and more interesting conversation. Um, next I have Tatiana Tropina uh, from Leiden University who needs a microphone. And please, can you sort of <coughs> help bring it in a little bit? Ah, uh, it's working now. Thank you very much, Avri. And I was listening to everybody and thinking about these 100 flavors of fragmentation, as Avri put it, or 50 shades of fragmentation. And I think the confusion comes from the fact that we place our belief, our faith in global connectivity on different layers of the internet. And I'm taking here purely technical, purely technocratic approach. For me, from this perspective, from the perspective of technical layer, nothing has challenged the global dominance of TCP IP, the system of unique identifiers, and if something has challenged it, for example, the incom incompatibility of IPv6 and IPv6, uh, IPv4 pro um, IP, ad IP addresses, this has been fixed. The technical tools have been developed for the global connectivity to win. So for me, the glue that brings all these layers together and provides us, fulfills this promise of global connectivity is still there. But I do understand that different speakers put faith and definition of global connectivity somewhere else, below the technical layer, then internet shutdowns become internet fragmentation, or above technical layer, then various content regulations, restrictions, censorship will also become internet fragmentation, because their promise of global connectivity is somewhere else. And this is where this debate gets confusing. To me, inter internet is not fragmented exactly because the glue that keeps us together, the technical layer, the, is still interoperable, it's still global, remove censorship, you will have connectivity. But once this layer is gone, everything is gone. So yes, it's not fragmented, but, but the question is, is there no danger? There is a danger. And to me, the danger is that by trying to regulate, by trying to, to territorialize information flows, by trying to exercise control for various reasons, be it preservation of political system or legitimate concerns about protecting their citizens from various threats, 
governments start imposing restrictions that might intentionally or unintentionally impose regulation that might intentionally or unintentionally tackle the technical layer. And here I have to go away from my technical, technocratic approach and say one thing. We like to think about technical layer like unique identifiers, TCP, IP, so it's all connected, it glues it together, it, it's working. But we have to think that this doesn't exist on its own. It exists not because the governments imposed it, not because regulation imposed it, it exists because the community, technical community, multi-stakeholder community put faith in it at some point by adoption of these protocols, by adoption of this system of unique identifiers. And it runs purely based on trust. And away from my technical technocratic approach, if regulation destroys either technical underpinnings or this trust, this is why internet is going to fragment. And I do believe that this is a danger here. And I would like to circle back to what Elena said about self-fulfilling prophecy. We talk about definitions a lot here. I do believe that at some point we start talking about solutions. And to me, one of the solutions would be to be very careful saying that internet is, is fragmenting or fragmented because it's some sort of perpetuating debate what we have to do, we have to start thinking about basics and basic commitments. I know that it's hard to fix government censoring the internet. And sometimes we have to stop label it as fragmentations because it, sometimes it would be just purely human rights abuses. And it's much fancier to say fragmentation, right? But we have to look into the core and at the core would be global connectivity and trust. And if this session can start any debate about steps forward. I would say that it would be commitment by governments, by technical community, by anybody else to these basics. And once we preserve these basics, when can we can solve any other problem because the global connectivity will prevail. Thank you. Thank you. So we get to a point where we really are starting to overload the term and we've overloaded it with all of our frustrations and unhappinesses and, and everything else and get in trouble. Next, I want to move to, and I've got a couple more before we'll come back around. So many good people to talk to here. Uh, with uh, Shital Kumar uh, from Global Partners. And please pass the microphone. No, that way. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I'm late, uh, but I'm really glad I got to catch Tatiana's input there because uh, I think it was very helpful. And um, the more I listen to these discussions, um, I the more I feel like we are actually getting somewhere um, as long as we're happy to navigate a choppy, a choppy uh, water. I think one of the challenges that we're facing is that we're trying, we're talking about something we're trying to preserve and also evolve. And so we're trying to figure out perhaps, um, as you were saying, Tatiana, what we need to preserve. And I think that's very helpful to identify and agree on and how we evolve that considering we need to preserve that. The issue is that whether through unintended or intended actions, and um, as you mentioned, a lot of those can come from regulation, there are challenges to preserving um, what, we, what we have. Uh, when it comes to the internet, those critical properties, um, the values and the principles of openness and connectivity and indeed user control and autonomy, those are being impacted or could be impacted by, by regulation and decisions and the normalization of actions like shutdowns, for example. So that, to me, is, is the challenge. And then how specific we are um, or how broad we are, I think that comes from, yes, perhaps identifying what we need to and agreeing on what we need to preserve, identifying what the challenges are to that, and then um, ensuring that we can continue to, to evolve the government, um, the, the internet, uh, according to that. So just quickly on where I think we've come to. I co-lead the policy network on internet fragmentation and we have developed this framework which was I think probably referred to before and um, there we have some recommendations under each of the elements of the framework uh, which are uh, 
the technical layer, um, where we refer to the critical properties of the internet, but also user experience, which combines sort of the impacts of government regulation and, and also corporate actions on um, user experience and develops recommendations based on those, and then governance as well. So the challenge of having uh, duplicative mandates or, or bodies that are not inclusive and therefore don't coordinate and communicate with each other. Now, if we, I believe, um, we could take any of those, and if we did some of that, that would be helpful to ensure um, that we are both preserving and evolving the internet in a way that preserves its original vision. Um, but it is also possible to do part of that and still go along the pathway. So I think what we're trying to figure out here is what, what is the pathway um, and to have some sort of compass for that. And what I hope is that the Policy Network's contribution, which builds on the contributions of many others who have worked on this topic, whether it's the World Economic Forum paper um, or the work of the Internet Society, helps to form that compass um, and to, to both preserve and evolve what we have um, so that we can move along the right pathway. Thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to mention we've got two more in this initial list. Then we have an online comment, and then I want to move into a more, you know, organic conversation. And I'll mention to the people there, there are empty seats around the table. So if you're going to want to say something, find yourself a seat because it's really easy to pass. Next, I have uh, Raul Echeverria, and the microphone should start moving towards him from Associate. Association, or something, I'm pronouncing it wrong, Latino Americano, the internet. So, Raul, please, I tried. Excellent pronunciation, Eric. <laughs> um, okay, that's very, very interesting uh, discussion. Um, and I think that's, that I said yesterday in a meeting that we, we have to escape from the, the, the issue of the definitions because uh, this is where we are stuck. It and, but we are clear. Uh, about uh, what things uh, we want, uh, how we want the internet to be, to behave, and, and what are the things that we don't want to happen on the internet. And I, one of the things we have is that people have the same experiences uh, on the internet uh, around the world. So, and it is not happening. Uh, uh, I have experienced that, as, as other colleagues uh, said before, uh, let's not put names on the countries, but. Uh, but I have been in countries where I have not had the same access to, uh, to the same applications that I use uh, uh, often in, a, in, in my country or in, the, in most of the world. Um, so the, uh, and there are others, as uh, Tatiana pointed out, should, and so the, there is risk in, in many policies that, that, uh, that create impacts, negative impacts in, in uh, in the in the way that that the 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 internet works, so the uh, I don't know. This maybe I think that we can be two years discussing what is fragmentation or what is not fragmentation, and probably we will not get a consensus. So I I, I would not spend time saying if uh, if internet is fragmented or not. We have problems. That's the point, and we we know what the problems are. And okay, that's uh, we can say okay. No, don't don't say that internet is fragmented because it's like uh, to, uh, to to create that uh, that uh, uh, idea that uh, well, it's, if it is already fragmented, so what's the problem? But but we have to be careful because uh, in fact there are policies that have already been adopted in many countries that that create a negative impact. That have huge risk on fragmentation. So we could, for not saying that, we can create also the opposite, uh, <laughs> the, the opposite uh, spirit, the idea of saying, ah, okay, uh, people complain when we pass this, this law and nothing happened. That's uh, everybody now is saying that uh, internet is not fragmented. So what's the problem? So let's uh, focus on what are the things that we don't want to happen. We want the people that to have the same experience and in the, in, in the internet uh, uh, in anywhere in the globe to take advantage of all the powerful of the connectivity. Uh, we don't want interference uh, from uh, governments or in, the, in deciding by us uh, what we can do or what, what uh, we cannot do. And, uh, and also the uh, that there are legitimate interests and, and, the, and right in the governments to take care about some things that are proportionally that uh, that we know that there is a 
okay, that there is a common understanding that uh, in, the, in the world about uh, <coughs> uh, child pornography, terrorism, and other things, but, uh, but also the, the measures that are taken to avoid the, the access to this kind of information should be proportional and reasonable, and, they, and not that uh, to, uh, to use a, 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 a big weak bomb to, to, to kill uh, an ant. No? So the, the, uh, so there are problems, this is the point, and we have to, to focus on that and instead of, say, discussing if internet is fragmented or not. Thank you. So we, so we move from quibbling over the definitions and the multiple definitions towards, and I really like the notion of combining two things, sort of the, uh, the pathway to solutions almost, the finding the actual problems and then working on solving them. The next person I have, and it's the last one of this first uh, round, as it were, is Paul Wilson from AP. Nick, do you have a microphone? I can give you this one or that one's coming. Hello, I'm uh, Paul Wilson uh, from APNIC. We're in, a member of the technical community, one of the regional internet address registries. And I think when we've, we've sp uh, spoken at, about fragmentation at, at all these nuanced and high levels, I'm not sure that we want to get back down into the, into the nitty gritty of the internet layer. So I, I just do want to say that the, the purpose of what happens at the regional internet registries is to avoid fragmentation. It is to ensure that we have an internet layer in that technical sense the underlying layer that supports everything else, that is unfragmented, that can continue to grow, it can continue to operate without fragmentation that can happen in various kinds. And it's, it's continuous work that needs to be done. It, um, as I tried to say in um, yesterday's panel, it's something that shouldn't be taken for granted because it can be eroded. And I think <coughs> taking, looking at fragmentation, as a whole and even at an individual layer and an individual case, I think we're all learning that um, fragmentation is not just a condition of the internet, it's a quality that, uh, that varies, uh, that comes and goes, it varies by, by layer, by context, by geography and so on. And so that, that goes at the, at the internet layer as well and what we're continually trying to do through policy making, through the IPv6 transition, through the, the um, management of the last supplies of IPv4 is to, is to preve preserve the integrity of the internet. So uh, if anyone wants to talk about specific as aspects of that, like IPv4 versus IPv6, for instance, then, then we can, but I, th I feel like we're, we're past that. I, I wanted to make just one observation that um, is about, about the changing nature of the internet itself and how really these things do need to be tracked and observed and, and analysed as the, as the internet grows and changes. Um, there's been a huge trend to a kind of fragmentation of the internet over, over the last decade um, towards CDNs. So content distribution networks which take copies of content and move those copies close to the consumers in order that, that it can be, they can be accessed uh, quickly. That's, that's a type of fragmentation because it kind of breaks the model where the user is accessing a service which somehow exists somewhere on the internet and that that service doesn't anymore, even though it looks like one service, even on one IP address, it, it actually doesn't exist in one place according to the classical model. It's, uh, it's distributed, it's fragmented, the original end-to-end -end model is, is kind of fragmented by that, by that situation. So that's a, that's a huge trend and a huge amount of the traffic on the internet has been, is these days delivered through CDNs. To the extent that um, the APNIC uh, scientist Jeff Houston uh, asked recently whether um, we were seeing the, f the death of transit on the internet. That is the, the ability of the internet to negotiate a connection from any one point to any other, other point um, through transit networks. And um, it's, a good, it's a good point because if you are no longer demanding transit, if you're no longer, longer demanding genuine end-to-end -end connectivity, then, um, then uh, it may well fade. But then along came COVID, and I think the fact that we had this, this incredible plethora of end-to-end, point-to-point video communications that, that became a necessity of everyday life sort of pointed out uh, the necessity, the, the real importance of that end-to-end -end internet, the, the ability of any endpoint to effectively connect to any other endpoint. And I was, um, I was struck actually by the, um, by the remote, uh, the virtual participation uh, by Javier before from the other side of the world on this high D, HD connection 
absolutely beautiful, perfect. And we had, you know, we have a point-to-point, end-to-end, unfragmented internet that's allowing that kind of um, that kind of connectivity to take place. And I think that's that's still that should be still pretty remarkable to all of us, and something something not to take for granted. Thank you. Thank you. You're right. It is rather miraculous that we can do that and that we assume that it's going to work and get kind of flustered when it doesn't. Okay. Uh, we're going to sort of move in the next. We, we've used about an hour. We, we've basically had a fair number of people give a fair number of good views that, that have sort of boiled the ocean a little bit for us. Um, Adam's going to read a comment that was online and then I'd like to basically... Up to now, it's been j- just talk until you got said what you wanted to say. Now, with a half hour left, sort of, if you've got brief points to make vis-a-vis what other people said, and, and Adam will carry around a microphone. And also, I wanted to ask if there's other participants here who weren't the assigned speaking participants who but would like to speak and have something to say. Please let us know so that we can get a microphone to you and you could speak, either sit here or Adam will bring you a a microphone. So please, Adam. Thank you. Um, Yes, this is on. Uh, Yeah, I do need the exercise, so please call for the mic. I'd love to rush over and give it to you in a second. Just there there is an online comment. It actually covers something that Tanya also mentioned. It's from Dhruv Dodi, and he he says, um, while all of these can be called uh, internet fragmentation, would you agree that they are not all equal and fragmentation at the technical layer that does not allow interoperability at all is a bigger threat than content moderation. Thus, is there a need for us all to be more nuanced when talking about internet fragmentation and sometimes, rather than sometimes clubbing them all together, which does not serve us well? So that was the comment, and I think Tanya touched on some of those issues. Um, Who would like a microphone and get me moving? I saw she kept putting her hand up, and then, and then, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Ponsley speaking, Gambia NRI. I, I just want to um, go back um, to Elena. She raised um, something on, on, on all the other speakers have re- um, really um, talked more about it, that it's not really a technical issue, which we know. And even when you try to put fragmentation, um, you try to um, package it down, you'll discover that most of what people are actually talking about is... Um, really um, human rights um, and digital rights being abused, whether it's shut down or whatever. So my question to her on this political stuff, that is, 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 that is likely what will break um, the internet. What type of political situations are you seeing? Because people might interpret them differently. I can use a situation like what happened in Gabon, in my continent of Africa, where um, Ali Bongo caught down the internet later he's overthrown when there was elections he cut it down now he started crying about using the internet to make some noise to get him released so some people will consider that um in a way in some parts in in especially in africa that oh shutting down the internet is a fragmentation you're depriving some people but actually it's not actually that so the political um if you can digress more elena on what actual political scenarios do you see can affect a breakdown in fragmentation, cutting off like a whole continent or a whole sector? Thank you. So we had Chetal, and you directly addressed a question though, correct? Yeah. It is now. Um, um, What Paul kind of ended on, which is, I don't, I don't think we are taking this for granted. I think there is a sense, even if we don't know exactly what it's around, that we're concerned that we're on the wrong, we're on the wrong path. And we're moving away from something is, that we, no, maybe isn't perfect, but is, is, we're moving away from it. And so I think my question would be, or provocation would be, do we know, uh, we all know we're not taking it for granted, but do we know what, perhaps to Raoul's point, like what we need to do, do we agree on what the, the main issues are and um, as I said you know some of us have been putting together recommendations including from this um, IGF from the multi-stakeholder policy network for what can be done is that useful is that helpful to say that if we implemented those recommendations things would get better Um, do we have that common understanding Um, because we are all clearly concerned about something 
Thank you. Uh, did you want to address anything directly? It seemed, and then I have the gentleman there, and then I have, no, he's already got a microphone. Yeah, I've got one. Yeah. Thank you so, very much. So, I'm, yeah. I'm Julius Ender from the W Academy in Germany, and I, I've maybe, I forgot your name, sorry, the, the lady in the black and white. Uh, you? <laughs> um, so, or maybe, I don't know who wants or can, can answer it. So, how, do, how would you connect the uh, discussion about fragmentation and, uh, and AI? Because what, what I see is that all the costs are being, r for running the internet uh, and providing all the data on all the servers and into the cloud are, is, is socialized and all the profits are privatized on a very few uh, a number of companies and uh, so we are kind of doing all the work and they are scrapping all of our data and sacking, sacking in the, um, the profit so is, isn't that also a kind of fragmentation so how would you connect these two or is it, do we, don't you see this kind of connection? Okay, trying to keep track of the hands and the order in which I see them. I did have Jorge, uh, but if somebody wanted to respond to what was it just asked, yes. I, yeah, please. Yeah, I wanted to respond to what was asked previously, not right okay. now. <laughs> if I can. Okay. And thank you very much for the question. I was actually noting, taking note of what the other people were saying and trying to react to that. I was going to get to that, to that point anyway. So, but let me get it from the beginning. Um, we can keep debating on how to define things, of course. Um, and by the way, you know, we do it because we were asked to do it here. So, uh, but I really like uh, Tanya's speech here. Uh, look, let's look at what we need to preserve. Okay? Um, the issues that Timea or Savie online uh, brought up are very, very important. Uh, we do have issues with data localization, islands of secluded content, shutdowns what have you, all that. I guess I'll try to put it in perspective in order to get to what we need to preserve. Um, if the inter internet breaks into split internets, into two, three, four different internets, then um, I think the problem becomes of a whole other magnitude. And the frustration that we're talking about, that we will all be feeling, will be of a whole other level. Um, Avery, you said before, we assume it just works. In this scenario that we're discussing, it will not just work. So it will be of another thing. So that's, that goes precisely to what we need to, to preserve. Um, Timea also mentioned, and other people mentioned uh, while we were discussing, legislation to address content issues that can um, have an adverse effect at the technical level. Um, agree, that happens. I also see, and no one in the technical community would say that legislation is not needed. There are very real problems on the internet that needs to be addressed. So if you will, when we have that and we have effect on the technical level, it's usually unintentional. And when you discuss with legislators and you explain, they fix it. The, the trend, and that is what worries me and goes back to the question that was asked by the, the, the gentleman over there, is Although so far has been intentional and unintentionally touching on the basics of the internet, the fundamentals, the identifiers, we have now initiatives, legislation, that is targeting the identifiers. We have now, in the context of the geopolitical situation we're in, if you will, we have now an, an effort to apply sovereignty over something that is by definition global. Um, and an example I can give is sanctions over APs as an action that, as an action that goes into that direction. Um, so yeah, therefore that is something that we need to avoid um, in order to preserve what we need to preserve. Going back to Tanya, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm starting to build up a queue here. I've got you at the microphone there. Then I've got Jorge then I've got Raul, then I've got Michael, and then I've got Tatiana. So that's the order I've managed to build. If I didn't get it quite right, I apologize, but. Would you also answer my question? Did you forget it? I, um. It's on. Uh, 
thank you. My name is Robin Green. I work with Meta um, on internet fragmentation issues as well as a range of human rights issues tied to encryption and surveillance and law enforcement access. Um, I thought this is an absolutely fantastic discussion. Thank you for, for hosting it. Um, one of the things that I've heard a few times um, over the course of this IGF and the many internet fragmentation conversations that we've had is this idea that content distribution networks um, are fragmenting the internet. And I want to push back on that a little bit because those networks are ultimately oftentimes necessary to actually connect people to services all over the world um, to make sure that those services are resilient, to make sure that people have access um, to fast internet service. Um, and at the end of the day, when we're talking about internet fragmentation, in my view, one of the things that we're really focused on is what is the effect, right? So whether you're talking about regulatory fragmentation of the internet that has technical implications or a core technical fragmentation of the internet like some folks have talked about, the thing that we actually care about is what is the user experience? Is the user experiencing fragmentation? Um, and if the goal of the internet, uh, wh which at least is the goal in my mind, is for people to be able to exercise their fundamental rights and whether those are economic rights, expressive rights, um, you know, accessing information, engaging in assembly and things like that. Um, at the end of the day, if their user experience is becoming fragmented in a way that they can't fulfill those goals, then to me that is internet fragmentation that needs to be addressed. And so we can sort of have this larger umbrella of internet fragmentation while still looking at things from a technical perspective and then a user experience perspective. But I think it would be a mistake to step away from the concept of internet fragmentation because something isn't you know, directly mandating a technical fragmentation even where the user experience still winds up being fragmented. And so that's where I do see things as data localization requirements or other other kinds of restrictions on cross-border data flows, um, restrictions on encryption that would be implicating people globally, users globally, and then similarly implications on uh, content takedowns and geo-blocking um, and other restrictions of free expression. Those are all elements of internet fragmentation. They're just, you know, whether they're technical or user experience oriented, um, you know, there's a difference there, but there's still things that I think we all need to consider. Thank you. Okay, now next I had uh, Jorge, and I also want to, I was reminded that there was a pending question in the air, so if any of you have it about the connection between AI, which has been a favorite subject. Um, oh, you're gonna have one, fantastic, we'll, we'll get there. I just want, I was reminded that I had not made sure the. Okay, so we'll get there. Oh, you want to do it now? I can. Okay. Uh, so just, it doesn't get lost because it was asked. Um, I wrote it down. How would you connect the discussions on fragmentations and AI? And I would say I would not connect them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm still in the queue for other issues. Ah. Thank you. Jorge, please. Okay. Uh, after this uh, <laughs> commentary. Um, uh, Jorge Cancio, Swiss government, uh, so on, on this question. So, so many things have been said. It's, it's difficult to, to add something, but I okay. couldn't resist. And I think uh, here, uh, as we are in the UN, in the IGF, we have to connect this also to the discussions we are having at the global level, what's happening at the global level. And if you look at how the situation is evolving, uh, just uh, four years ago, we had a report from the high-level panel on digital cooperation, which was called uh, the age of digital interdependence. So really the, the focus was uh, made or laid on uh, what unites us and uh, how dependent we are with each other and through the, the digital tissue that uh, unites many things. And uh, I just wanted to, to mention that because the situation today is a completely different one. I guess that even if uh, such a panel would try to to name its uh, report 
the, the same way it would be criticized as being completely out of, of the reality where we live with uh, very fundamental geopolitical tensions. So I uh, just wanted to, to share that and uh, also recall that we are in, in the midst of this process towards a global digital compact where internet fragmentation is one of the topics to, to be considered. And going back to, to something that uh, Paul said before and others, uh, the internet interoperability at the technical level is not a given. It's not really something that we should take for granted. Um, it really relies, uh, apart from this uh, history of trust, of building this network, it relies on huge network effects on incentives and benefits for everyone connecting to this unique uh, network. But really the pressures are mounting at, uh, at this geopolitical level. So there may come a time where uh, those pressures, perhaps also uh, joined by alternatives at a standards level, at other levels, become so important that uh, the, this uh, delicate fabric of trust uh, which holds uh, the, the tissues together uh, built by millions of, of networks of networks uh, begin to erode. So this is something that I think is really the fundamental level of uh, internet fragmentation and uh, uh, the same way that this is a fabric of millions of millions of networks, uh, it is also in the hands of those millions of people taking decisions with their networks, with their companies, with their governments, who can take decisions going into the right direction or into the wrong directions and uh, can decide to invest into holding that tissue together or to really continue eroding that tissue into some uh, into a, a direction that may end up with uh, a fragmentation. So perhaps this decision or this recommendation of investing into the right direction and which is something in the hands of many of the people coming here uh, could be something for the policy network on uh, internet fragmentation and for some good recommendations, useful recommendations coming out of this IGF and flowing into the GDC. So hope that was helpful after so many thoughtful uh, inputs. Thank you. I'm starting to have a very long list here in a very short amount of time. I've got Raul next. <coughs> yes. Uh, <coughs> the colleague that raised the point of political situation uh, left the, the meeting, but, but I, I wanted to come back to, to, to that point because, uh, 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 it's, of course, uh, we are accustomed that in, 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 in countries that are not democratic or with uh, weak democracies, is we are accustomed to see that it's normal to, the, to impose uh, restrictions to uh, access to content and uh, but uh, so it's something, by the way, something that we naturalize in the, in, and we should not. But, uh, uh, but it's not the only problem, and, and this is something that we expect. You know, that, uh, but uh, but now we are facing problems in democratic countries and uh, and strong democracies that are are passing uh, uh, laws and developing public policies that are really affecting the the the, the, the user experiences and. Uh, Sometimes it's based on uh, measures that uh, try to protect uh, intellectual property in, uh, in the networks or, or uh, because of some taxation or other things. But uh, for, uh, sometimes because, because for lack of awareness and the, the, the effect that the policies uh, uh, could have on the internet, the, those things are, are adopted. Um, 
Um, I, I, I'm sorry to say that my experience on policymakers is not only as successful as the colleague uh, from I can say that uh, many times we explain to the to to, to policymakers and, and we are not uh, successful in uh, in changing their mind because they they have, as I said yesterday in another meeting, the 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 incentives of policymakers are diverse. Um, sometimes they have a political decisions to protect an industry or protect a, 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 um, or from disruption, and, uh, and the, so they, they they have they have commitments. They have to move ahead with uh, with decisions, even knowing that they are creating a negative impact. As a, as a friend of mine uh, usually says, uh, sometimes when the, when uh, <coughs> policies don't don't fit with reality. Uh, some policymakers who try to do is try to change the reality instead of uh, <laughs> changing the policies. <laughs> and, uh, so there is, it's a problem. Not as I, I wanted to, to come back to the political situation because it's not only a, a, a problem uh, with the dictatorships or not democratic authoritarian regimes. It's a, a, a problem. The, the risk is really uh, big of, of uh, having this uh, fragmented experience that is what matters because. Nobody cares about the bytes. We care about what the people uh, do on the internet. So if it's, uh, this is the, what uh, really matters. Thank you. Next, I've got Michael Rothert. Hi. My, my name is Michael Rothert. Um, I'm from the Association of the Internet in Industry in Germany. I'm working with the internet since 1983, and when we started, um, there were only fragments. The whole, there was no internet. It consists only of fragments in the various countries, fragments of services, fragments of networks, everything. And what we did at that time was building gateways. Of course, that may not be efficient. Um, and uh, there is a risk of filtering, I admit, but I'm pretty much sure if fragmentation on the technical level goes on, someone will find a technical solution for that one, and then we only have to deal with the political stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I think I come from that same generation where, for me, the Internet's constantly becoming. Uh, Tatiana. Unfortunately, the gentleman who asked the question about a feasible scenario for fragmentation left, but it did, I wanted to say that we can think about technical scenario, like, I don't know, some alternative route or alternative standards or alternative system of unique identifiers. I do not believe in this, strictly speaking, exactly because I think that the technical community has enough experience of... Uh, connecting things by coming up with technical solutions so the connectivity wins and plus if this is imposed by the governments uh, it will in, in, incur um, huge sunk costs. I do not think that this is completely unrealistic maybe in the future if one region like the European Union decides to go with absolutely different technical standards it might happen. Where I see the feasible scenario and this is I think where it becomes very important is when regulation which is imposed targets technical layer in a way that what Jorge called fabric of trust uh, is eroded. When something on the technical layer, be it root zone servers, be it, be it unique identifiers, IP addresses in certain regions have different frameworks for governance. When the multi-stakeholder governance does not cover it all, or there are competing frameworks for, with what we have now. And here it brings me to the point what we want to preserve. I think we want to preserve essentially what makes the internet the internet. We want to preserve this uniqueness, this glue, technical identifiers, protocols, and ensure that any developments will make them still interoperable. But I think much more important in, in terms of feasibility of any, um, I, I reluctantly say this word, fragmentation scenario, we need to preserve this trust. We need the firm commitment to the multi-stakeholder model of governance, not of engagement, not of discussion, but of governance because this is how the technical layer has been governed and this is what we have to constantly recommit ourselves to. Thank you. Thank you. As we come closer and closer to the end with seven minutes, uh, please, Tomaki. Yes, thank you. 
So um, I wanted to answer two questions. One, uh, this, uh, the splinternet discussion, how it relates to AI. Um, I think I have slightly different take. Uh, and there are two relations that I can think of. Number one, um, AI, uh, especially the current uh, like lar large language model kind of AIs, uh, they are built up on a massive uh, training data set, which is enabled in a way by the unified internet. So um, if we wanted to leap some benefits from it, from those AI, AIs, uh, it's important that internet is large and as interconnected as right as they are right now. And also, um, more to the political uh, domain, um, I think it's good that some of the AIs can um, uh, provide at least some um, advanced capacity to translate and uh, overcome language barriers, which in a um, content layer level, I, I'd say, um, connects the internet even more. Uh, so that's my take on the relationship. And uh, the other question I wanted to address was if the technical layer uh, uh, fragmentation matters more than the content layer. And I think the answer basically is yes, but not in a simple way. Uh, my understanding is that if, suppose if that uh, uh, all the world's government had very strong uh, granular and very speedy capability to regulate uh, online communications of any kind, uh, then the government doesn't really care about shutting down the internet connections uh, because such a measure is always a blunt instrument compared to very granular control of the co communication. But of course, no, no government has such measures, so uh, it matters that internet's, uh, internet is uh, connected to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think I have four people left. The next one is ha uh, Javier online. Then I've got Paul, then Dushan, then Uta. And if I get all those in, we're really doing great. Uh, that means you're speaking briefly. So Javier, are you ready? Online. Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. So uh, one thing that I would like to add is more into the side of solutions, right? Just to try to, to move into something different. When it comes to what we have identified as the core um, fragmentation threats in terms of what happens with the protocols and um, identifiers. Uh, we have heard of that the main um, threats on that front come from the governments, right? Governments that are feeling sometimes uh, impotent in when it comes to try to control uh, the, the internet in order to execute some of their public policies or priorities. So maybe isn't then a, a, a reinvigoration of the multi-stakeholder model, uh, more attention to that, maybe an active denunciation of those advancements by governments, you know, extreme advancements by governments, and also getting more information to users or to, to those who can exert pressure onto their own governments, a way of, of offering um, a solution. Maybe we should be doing that. Um, just thinking about, you know, like what, what's the main threat um, to the more specific technical aspect of this, and maybe, you know, with more participation and active denunciation of that advancement by governments, and we can make a, a valuable contribution to that. Thanks. Thank you. Paul, please. CDNs are useful, and I didn't mean to indicate they aren't, uh, but they don't help people to access the internet. They help people to access specific services and content of specific CDNs, and nothing more than that. If we're talking about um, user experience, fragmentation to me as a user is, is a lack of interoperation between similar services. And to that end, I want to have a single instant messaging account, like I do an email account, and still exchange messages with others who choose to use different services, whether they are WhatsApp or Signal or anything else. And I'd say the same about social media. Those services could, int could interoperate, and they don't. They generally don't, and that's a choice of the company's concerned. And I think that will continue, and that will continue to me to represent a fragmentation of, of my experience on the internet. Those companies will continue to do that until they're required to change that behavior. And I wouldn't mind seeing that day come. Thank you. Thank you. Please, back to Dujan. Yeah. 
I will sit here. Uh, Dusan, for the record, uh, uh, from Serbia. So uh, I would like just to express uh, one uh, frustration that I have ab about fragmentation. So we call everything fragmentation. We call uh, filtering for uh, fragmentation. We call, uh, I remember, uh, and uh, uh, I agree with uh, previous uh, talks that uh, when, whenever, uh, when I was involved in internet, it was fragmented. Later on, we were talking about balkanization, if you remember, to 2014, 15, and 16. Uh, IDN domain names, for example, are still fragmenting the internet. So, technical layer is still uh, the, uh, the protected layer, uh, as I would say, and it is connecting everything, but we have uh, given governments to legislate in their part of the internet, so that part of the internet can be and sh uh, should be fragmented. On the other side, we are fragmented with uh, filtering, don't call it fragmentation. Don't, uh, we are uh, blocking or something like that. Let's talk about those particular topics, not call it uh, fragmentation. So we will have a high level discussion on uh, everything without uh, substance. Thank you. Uta, you get the next to last word because mine will be last. Oh my, um, so since we've been collecting f indicators for fragmentation, sort of been uh, writing up a research agenda about this, I'd like to put one more point next to this, and that is that we've been focusing very much on the technical layers, um, and why that, of course, is very important. I now find it important to mention that there, if we will, is this social layer underlying the internet as a network of networks, and that is, consists of network engineers who maintain these systems and um, have a huge, um, in an informal community with informal values and, and forms of coordination that um, may be aging. And so if we are looking at this in the future, then we may be wanting to look at this community as well and their capabilities of um, actually keeping things together. Thank you very much. And thank you all for a great conversation. And I'm certainly not going to sum it up because that would take forever. But this simple mind of mine walks away with fragmentation as a four-letter word with lots of nuance and lots of use. So thank you very much. <laughs>